this video we'll be looking at cofactors. Now what you need to know about cofactors is uh, what they are and the uh, uh, two other types of cofactors that, and also some of the examples of each and every one of them. But before we do that, we need to think about what is the purpose of cofactors and why do they even exist in the first place. So to do that, we need to think about the production of enzymes in cells. So enzymes are basically biological catalysts. They are proteins, and that means that they have to go through protein synthesis. There are DNA and the genes inside our nucleus, uh, which, which codes for all of the different enzymes, and they are all produced using the ribosome and transcription and translation. And usually we say that a lot, of, for a lot of the enzymes, when they were produced, they are produced in the form we call as apple enzyme. And the apple enzyme is actually an inactive form of the enzyme. So when it's made in the apple enzyme form, it can't actually catalyze any reaction whatsoever. It's only when uh, they experience uh, maybe an activation, then they turn into hollow enzyme which is the actual active form of the enzyme. So this is the one that actually goes and to do all the different chemical reactions. So this activation relies, uh, it's basically usually a change in the tertiary structure. And what we're gonna be thinking about is how do they actually activate the apple enzyme into a hollow enzyme? So usually there are three ways to activate the apple enzyme. One way of activating the apple enzyme would be the use of another enzyme. So an example would be things like protein kinases, which are very good at phosphor, uh, phosphorylating other enzymes, which then in terms of making them becoming activated. Another possible way to activate apple enzymes would be the change in the surrounding conditions. So it could be a change in temperature or a change in pH. An example for this is the enzyme called pepsin, uh, pepsin and pepsinogen. So pepsin is actually an enzyme that is found in the stomach. Um, so it is a type of protease that breaks down the proteins in our food into amino acids. But it is not made in the form of pepsin, it was made in the form of pepsinogen. And pepsinogen, so imagine this case, right? So the, uh, the cells in the stomach will go through protein synthesis to produce pepsinogen. But imagine if we don't have pepsinogen, pepsinogen in the first place, they directly produce pepsin but your cell itself are also made of lots of proteins. There are enzymes in there, there are also the cytoskeleton and lots of actual structures, organelles in the cell that are made of proteins. So if pepsin is made in this active form uh, in the cell, the moment it was made but in the ribosome, it will start digesting all the proteins inside your cells. And obviously that will be bad because it's basically digesting your own stomach. So actually the cells would make it in the form of pepsinogen, which is inactive, and then release it, let's say by exocytosis, into the actual stomach. And when it's actually in the stomach, uh, where there is hydrochloric acid that is also being produced, it is the low pH environment produced by the hydrochloric acid that will cause the pepsinogen to turn into pepsin. So this mechanism cleverly would stop your, uh, the production site of any enzymes that you have from being destroyed by the product itself. So this is why it's important that we have an apple enzyme, which is the inactive precursor, and then we activate it in some method to turn it into the hollow enzyme when we, when we actually need it. So the changing conditions is, uh, this is a really good example for how a changing condition could actually change the, uh, activate the enzyme. And the third one that we need to know, obviously, is our focus today is the cofactors. And what we'll do now is to think about what are the different types of cofactors and some of the examples that you need to be aware of. So in this diagram, it kind of summarizes how we can classify different types of cofactors. Now, the reason I'm using this particular diagram rather than using a, a flow chart or a, a mind map is because there are certain chemicals that are classified as cofactors themselves, but then within cofactors, there could be also coenzymes, which are also cofactors, but with a slightly different characteristic. And there'll be things that are prosthetic groups, but which are also considered as cofactors, but again, slightly different. So hence why. And now let's have a think about what are the similarities and differences between these three different things. So I'm going to start with cofactors. So first of all, cofactors are generally uh, inorganic. And uh, what we mean by that is that they are usually made from mineral ions. So some common mineral ions that you would know would be things like sodium ion, potassium ion, nitrate ions if it's in a plant, etc. But so cofactors are ions basically, so they're inorganic. 
And cofactors are temporarily bound, uh, usually to the actual enzyme. So that means it's only when they, they will probably be floating about and when they bind to the enzyme, then they will activate it. So an example that you might want to be aware of would be the chloride ions inside amylase. So chloride ions will bind to the amylase to, uh, to activate it, to break down starch into um, maltose. So without chloride ions, amylase wouldn't actually work. So that's what cofactors are. Now within that genre, we have a specific type of cofactors called coenzymes. Now as the name implies, it's coenzyme, so enzyme is kind of referring to the biological aspect to it. So coenzymes are basically organic cofactors, and they're usually made from vitamins or derived by, from vitamins, so things like vitamin A, B, C, or D, etc. Now one similarity that they have is that both coenzymes and cofactors are temporarily bound only, so they could leave the protein or the enzyme after a while. So there are two particular examples of coenzymes that you need to be aware of. You will actually learn about them again when you go into um, uh, the A2 content. So these two examples are actually called NAD and NADP, uh, which are both which are actually involved in uh, respiration, if it's NAD, and NADP is, re uh, is involved in photosynthesis. So you don't actually need to know them in a lot that, in that much more detail, but just be aware that they exist and they're both hydrogen carriers in those two particular chemical reactions. So they won't bind to the proteins for long, they will just bind to it and then get the uh, hydrogen and then you should leave. Now the last one is about prosthetic groups, and prosthetic groups are probably the more uh, the one that's more different than the rest of them, because prosthetic groups are, are cofactors that are permanently bound to the actual enzyme or the protein. So this is a more famous example of a prosthetic group. You probably would have come across it in chapter three about biological molecules, about conjugated proteins, and you would come across it again when you go into chapter eight, a transport in animals about the transport of oxygen. So iron ion is found in the heme group, which is found inside the subunits of a hemoglobin. So a hemoglobin is a globular and conjugated protein because it's got a prosthetic group bound to, which is inorganic, which is bound to the uh, organic protein itself. So they are involved in the transport of oxygen. Another example that you need to be aware of now is that there are zinc ions inside an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. You will come across this enzyme again when you go into chapter 8 about transport in animals, specifically about the transport of carbon dioxide in blood. And carbonic anhydrase is an essential enzyme in the red blood cell that actually helps in that particular process. And again, without the zinc ion actually bound inside the carbonic anhydrase, they wouldn't be able to work. So there you have it, that is, uh, the diff those are the different types of cofactors. Just a very quick recap, so we've got cofactors that are chemicals that are inorganic and they're temporarily bound to the enzyme uh, to activate it. And an example would be the chloride ions inside amylase. Uh, another type is called the coenzymes, which are organic versions of cofactors and they are still tem temporarily bound only. And these are things like NAD and NADP, uh, which act uh, as ca hydrogen carriers in respiration and photosynthesis. The third type is the prosthetic groups, which are cofactors again, but they are permanently bound uh, in the actual enzyme and the protein. Examples would be things like iron ion in the heme group inside the hemoglobin, which is responsible for uh, transporting oxygen particularly, or the zinc 2 plus ions, which are, also, uh, which are found in carbonic anhydrase, which is found inside the replica cells responsible for uh, the carbon dioxide transport. And actually these two are both found in the replica cell and they both have a really key role in playing the transport of these two gases around the body. And this is everything you need to know about cofactors.